so grateful to be joined this afternoon by Rector Littell and members of the Board of Visitors and by public officials. Will all of you please stand and wave so you can be recognized. And we also have our first gentleman 
This is his front yard, Bruce Jacobson. Give us a wave. Thank you. At Convocation, we celebrate everyone who is beginning their careers at William & Mary. Walking through these doors for the first time last year was a powerful moment for me as a newcomer to William & Mary. This walk through the Wren signifies the start of a new chapter in our lives. The experience of being new and the instability that it generates and the opportunity that it creates for us and brings us together here as a community today. These are our themes today. This afternoon we will hear from several members of our community who are fearlessly diving into new arenas of discovery and creativity and learning. It's now my pleasure to introduce one such leader, our new provost. This year, William & Mary welcomed Dr. Peggy Agouris as our sixth provost. Dr. Agouris is a noted scholar, a distinguished researcher and writer, and an avid pianist. In addition to leading William & Mary's academic enterprise, she co-chairs the university's strategic planning committee and its business innovation committee. Dr. Agouris received her engineering degree from the National Technical University of Athens and her master's and doctoral degrees from The Ohio State University. Before joining William & Mary, she was dean of the College of Sciences at George Mason University. We are delighted that Dr. Agouris and her family have become part of the William & Mary community. Please join me in giving a warm William & Mary welcome to our sixth provost, Dr. Peggy Agouris. Thank you, President Rowe, for this lovely introduction. Hi. <laughs> like you, I am new to William and Mary. And um, I arrived less than two months ago. And even though I was always aware of the reputation of William and Mary, I'm amazed by what I have been discovering every day since I have been here. The breadth and depth of this institution, the quality of the people, the warmth that I've received are remarkable, and I will never forget that. I'm sure that many of you did what I did as you were preparing for today. I asked around for advice and tips on how to be successful at William & Mary, and I received many. But there's one thing that everybody, almost everybody, told me, um, that one tip that most people gave me uh, as I was getting ready to come here. The cheese shop. <laughs> so some of you, I can see it in your faces, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and that was my reaction as well. But you know, I, this wasn't, that was not the only tip I received. I was also told to ask for extra house dressing on the side. So I guess that I'm ready now for my role as provost of William and Mary. Um, like you, I will be learning new things. Like you, I will be looking forward to um, making my own contribution. Um, but one thing that this, the, the, sometimes I get asked, and I'm sure that a lot of you are not fully aware of what the role of the provost is. And this is something that I hope I will be able to uh, make you understand better as we get to know each other well. So the role of the provost is, the official version of it, is it's the chief academic officer of an institution responsible for academic and research programs, for budgets, for facilities, a lot of fun things. In other words, it's an easy job with a light workload. But the one thing that makes this position remarkable and appealing and I'm looking forward to is working with you, connecting with you throughout the, your years here so that I and you together can work towards making your educational experience at William and Mary a remarkable, successful, and fun one. And that we all together can contribute to further strengthening the reputation of this great institution. Um, because of that, I'd like to ask you to not hesitate to reach out 
to ask for help, to offer suggestions, not just for sandwich shops, but anything. And together, we'll figure out a way to solve everything and really make things great during your years here. I'm here to support you. Let's not forget that. But today is not about me or the role of the provost or the tips I've received. Today is all about you. Today we have 15, more than 1,500 freshman students out of 14,600 applicants, including 181 transfer students, 12 exchange students, and 12 University of St. Andrews joint degree program host students. Three quarters of you, 75% of you, graduated at the top 10% of your classes. And 100% of you showed excellence in fields that you know, I cannot even begin to describe. So all of you deserve to be here. All of you really did something remarkable to find your way here. One third of you are students of color. 7% are international students. And 10% are first generation students. I'm telling you all this because as I said before, Today is all about you, the students who are making this university such an amazing place to learn, to explore, to live. I know that you have worked really hard to get here. I know that you have competed with many qualified students for a spot here in front of the Rand Building. I know that you and your families have given up a lot to get here, but you did it, you're here, and we're so proud of you. Welcome and congratulations, class of 2023. Thank you, Provost Seguris. We are so thrilled to welcome you in turn here to William & Mary this year. It's now my pleasure to invite Senior Class President Cody Mills to the podium for a very special announcement. Graduate students, transfers, freshmen, welcome. Each year, the sophomore, junior, and senior classes welcome first year students by presenting them with a class banner. For those of you who are transfers or graduate students, your banners are already hanging in the center court dining area at the Sadler Center. Aria Austin, president of the junior class, and Suha Sadala, president of the sophomore class, are above me on the balcony to help present the class of 2023 banner. We hope it will be a symbol of unity and belonging for your class throughout your years here together and in the years that follow as you, like all classes before you, become alumni of William & Mary. The banner will remain here for a week, after which it will be moved to the center court dining area at the Sadler Center, where it will hang until commencement 2023. Since there is not yet an elected representative of the class of 2023, President Rowe, we ask that you accept this banner on their behalf. President Mills, it is my great privilege to accept this banner on behalf of the great class of 2023. Thank you, Madam President and Mr. President. Please unveil the banner. In this year's convocation speaker, we're fortunate to have an incredible teacher whose core message will be becoming, evolving, and basking in the instability of the new. She brings us a powerful model as we embark upon a year of strategic planning. Beth Comstock courageously seeks out the unexpected and the extraordinary. She serves on the board of directors at Nike and she's a visiting scholar at Columbia University's Center for Science and Society, a trustee of the National Geographic Society, and a member of the advisory board of the MIT Media Lab. As a former vice chair of innovation at General Electric, Ms. Comstock oversaw the company's sales, marketing, and communications, and started GE's digital and clean energy efforts. Previously, she was president of integrated media at NBC Universal, 
where she oversaw their digital efforts, including the development of the streaming service, Hulu. Ms. Comstock is a William & Mary alumna from the class of 1982, and she holds a degree in biology. She's the author of Imagine It Forward, Courage, Creativity, and the Power of Change. In an interview with Forbes magazine, she was asked for her best career advice. I hope I'm not stealing your line. Her response was playful and profound, and I share it with you today as you head into the new academic year. She said, get out of your office and discover things that are new and different and even weird. You must make time to wallow in the new. That invitation to wallow in the new is so important for us here today. Please join me in welcoming Beth Comstock. So great to see all of you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, President Rowe. Um, I uh, came to William & Mary a long time ago. I, uh, it was about 40 years ago. Uh, it's probably hard for many of you to imagine forward that far. Uh, it's probably kind of scary to think ahead that far. It was for me, and back in that day, there was no face age app to tell you what you might look like. Um, I wouldn't have imagined this, I'll tell you that. Um, William & Mary was the only school I ever wanted to go to. My father was a history buff, and he used to bring us here all the time. When I was 12, I decided I was going to go here. I picked out my room, Jefferson, second floor, center left. And I applied early decision, and that was it. William and Mary are bust, and luckily they let me in. Uh, so I lived deeply uh, during my time here. I soaked it up. It gave me some incredible perspectives to call on as I went out and, uh, and built my life. I'm really grateful for what, what William and Mary offered me, and today I want to share a little of that and what I've learned since then. Um, but I have a question for you. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I want to know why you're here. I want you to think about that for a minute. What are you doing here? Um, I know you got in, so congratulations, right? Up until this point, it's been a lot of work just to say you got in, but you got in. You're here. Congratulations. But why are you here? Why are you here at William & Mary? What are you hoping to accomplish while you're here? Would you want to land a good job? Is that you're thinking? I'm going to go here so I can land a really good job. Are you planning to go to med school, law school, hoping to pay back your student loans with, with what happens after here? Look, going to college is about an investment in your future. We, we absolutely know that. It's an investment in your future career, but it's really about an investment in all of you, the you now and the you in the future. And so I really hope one of your motives in being here <laughs> is to wonder, to discover. Um, as President Rose said, I'm really big on discovery. And to me, discovery is about infusing yourself with this spirit of inquiry and curiosity. It's about turning the world into your classroom. It's about learning and unearthing ideas that lead to something better. Look, I'm talking about a learning that, that goes way beyond what happens here at William & Mary. It's far beyond the campus. So when I came to William & Mary, I thought I was going to go to medical school. That's what I figured I was coming here to do. I majored in biology, although I really loved anthropology. We didn't even have minors then, but I think I maybe minored in anthropology. I loved writing. I loved art. And when I left here, it wasn't Surprisingly for me, it wasn't to go to medical school. I actually left here to become a science journalist, a very different idea than when I started. And after a few years of trying to make it as a journalist, I ended up behind the scenes of TV um, where there were all kinds of jobs I never imagined existed. I became a producer, then I became a publicist, and then that led me to the marketing side, uh, to the business side, and then as a business innovator, creating and launching new businesses. Now that sounds like it makes perfect sense, right? It just, that's, that's not a straight path, not at all. My career, biology to a corporate business, corporate vice chair, was not a straight path at all. It was curvy, it was foggy, it was uphill, it was downhill, it was dead end and back again. And my guess is that your path is going to be somewhat like that, too. At least, I hope it is. I think that's a good thing, and you need to be ready for the unexpected. 
You have to be open to what's next, what's new. And unfortunately, once you leave here, that gets harder. And if you're not careful, it might start to get harder when you're here. And I want to give you some advice on how to think about that. So one of the things I learned in business is that the systems in business, and certainly the systems in a lot of organizations, they have a really hard time with the unexpected. The, the, the systems and the organizations tend to close a person's aperture. They do it pretty quickly. Uh, the systems prioritize productivity, optimization, certainty, data. There's never enough data. Give me more data. But what they don't prioritize enough is curiosity. I have to tell you, sadly, I worked and met too many people who discarded their curiosity really early on. They stopped asking good questions. They were afraid to try something new. They gave up on their imaginations, the one thing that was uniquely theirs. But for me, because the business world I encountered was inwardly focused, I found there was real success to ha be had by being different. First of all, I'm a woman, and largely in the businesses I worked for, most of the leadership was men. But I'm talking about difference that's much deeper than that. It was about being different in how I saw the world. So I had to journey outside. I was driven by wonder. Discovery became my calling. I, look, it may not sound like it now, but trust me when I tell you, I was a shy, introverted person. I, I imagine myself sitting where you are now, 40 years ago, I was probably in one of the first rows because I always had to show up for everything, everything earlier. I never could have imagined I'd be standing up here I'm doing what I'm doing now. But I was always curious. And that curiosity, it gave me confidence and it became like rocket fuel for me. So I started to build my expertise by understanding what's happening out there. What's going on beyond the walls of the companies I worked in. Uh, I started to get good at trends, understanding where's the world going, whether it was about clean tech or streaming video or digital and, and blockchain. You know what, you, what I started to find out is it's not about my ideas. It was about seeing patterns, getting good at understanding how things are coming together, to see where the future's unfolding. And then it's about working with other people to craft a story, to get a lot of people to take new action toward a new future. I started to develop a, a point of view that said, why wait for change to get to you? Change happens out on the horizon. You have to go meet it. So look, I think one of the reasons you're here is to prepare to take on this incredibly fast-changing world at a time when the world is really going to need you and is going to need imaginative people who solve problems in new ways. We need problem solvers. Hopefully that's a job for you. Our problems are growing so much more complex. Change is happening so much faster. One of my favorite lines is this notion that the world will never be slower than it is right now. We can all celebrate the fact that it's not ever going to be any slower than this. Uh, indeed, I think there's scary things that are also exciting, but take something like the rise of artificial intelligence. I actually think it's going to call for our, our world is going to be calling for more people who exhibit creativity and human imagination in the face of what machines are, are doing. So I think the calling starts right now. It starts right now for you to wander and, and wonder to build what I think is really important, a lifetime practice of discovery. Now look, it's not gonna come from a line of code or a spreadsheet. It's not gonna come from feeling accomplished because you've done everything on the checklist. It's not gonna become beca come because you've followed the prescribed order of the way things are done. The challenge now, right now is your beginning. The challenge is to challenge yourself to open up to new ideas, to new people, to new places. You have to get good at seeing those patterns. You have to seek out people whose, whose view contradict, contradicts your view of the world. You have to seek out people who make you feel uncomfortable, especially if they're weird. I, I'd say really it's about seeking out things that are weird and different. You have to deviate, even if it's just a little bit. Honestly, I wish I had done more of that when I was here, sought out more weird been a little bit more weird. When I came to William & Mary, my world was small and I felt so comfortable in it. I grew up in Winchester, Virginia. Then it was a pretty small town in the Shenandoah Valley. 
I was a small town Virginia good girl, and, uh, and I was so happy that that was my story. Except, you know what? I came to realize that was not really my story. It was a narrative that other people had built for me, and I had to change that. So I came to understand that I am the author of my story. The world was out there not for my comfort, but for my discovery. To discover, to experience things that I never would have, ima have imagined from that really comfortable perspective. And so I was able to make my way in business and media and industry and took me to very different places. And I became sort of the one who always sought out the weird. I mean, I was the one who went and did, judged boy band competitions in Korea when we were looking for new trends in digital media. I learned how to do maintenance in F-15s with the Israeli army as we were looking to understand the Israeli startup culture. I was one of the first women in my com company to go into Saudi Arabia at a time when women weren't welcome and to understand that women were dying of cancer and we could help. Discovery takes you places and helps you see things. It can even help change the world. So look, I'm still very much this small town Virginia girl. I live in New York now, but my small town upbringing really helped shape me. So did my time here at William & Mary. And while I'm deeply committed to doing good in the world, I have to tell you, um, I'm really less of a rule-keeping good girl than I was when I first came here. So that's my story, small town girl who wants to discover the world. I recently was cleaning out some papers and I found my autobiography that I wrote when I was 14, okay? Like, no one has an interesting autobiography at 14. It was so boring. I think I asked, like, when's Nick Thomas gonna kiss me or something? Um, but I did write two sentences that were incredibly uh, timeless. I wrote, I am ambitious. I want to be 50 different things when I grow up. That 14-year-old that is still me. I still can identify with that. Yeah, I'm ambitious. And yeah, I still want to do 50 different things. And that's who I am. That's part of my story. So that's another question I have for you today. What's your story? A good story is about owning where you came from. It's about discovering new elements about yourself and declaring, this is what I want. This is where I plan to go. Your story contains your aspirations, your attempts, your trial, your error, and yeah, your failures. It's about conflict, it's tears, it's laughter. You can't do it alone, and it changes. Stories about vision. And every organization, every team, every person has to have a vision. It's about what you value, it's about taking action. I'm convinced story is the glue that binds us, it makes the future. So now part of your discovery journey is to craft your story. Hopefully when I see you later and I say, what's your story? you can start to think about what's your story. William & Mary isn't going to write that for you. There's no professor here that's going to hand you a piece of paper and say, okay, here you go. Um, your parents, they're not writing that for you, sorry. Nor are your future employees, employers. Only you can write it. What's your story? Now's the time to start thinking about it. And finally, my guess is you're going to need something else as you start this discovery story crafting journey. You're going to need permission. Now, that may seem like an odd word for me to be throwing out here. Um, because I found that in the course of making change and going where things are different and weird, we sometimes have to give ourselves permission to risk something, to try something new, to take steps. Of course, you might think about big steps, but sometimes even to take small steps. I mean, maybe it could be as simple as taking a risk and introducing yourself to someone new here. Uh, everyone's new to most of you here, so why not take a risk on it? Uh, maybe it's about asking a question in class that intimidates you. Or it could be really, really a big thing, like declaring an unexpected major, pitching a big idea, pursuing a secret new passion. And maybe when you hear me say this, you're thinking, yeah, but, you know, I'm not that kind of person. I could never do that. So here's my last question for you. Who are you going to wait for you to tell you it's okay? Your mom's not here anymore. Your teachers, you left them at high school. Who, who are you going to tell you it's OK? Here's the answer. It's you. And sometimes I found a little device that kind of helps. Take yourself back to high school. And you may recall that you forged your mother's signature to get out of phys ed and chemistry. I, of course, was too much a goody-two-shoes good girl to ever do that, but I've made up for lost time. 
And that notion of writing yourself a permission slip, now you have to do it for yourself. Just at those moments when you think, I could never do that, write it out. I give myself permission to just, just try something. And look, I know it's so much easier to play it safe. Deep inside, we're afraid. And I think people don't talk enough about it. This is a secret no one else lets you in on. We're all afraid. We're afraid to take a risk on something different. We're afraid to try something different. We're afraid to admit we like something that's not part of the prescribed order. We're afraid to own an action. We're afraid to own our story. And so there's a lot of courage that has to be summoned at moments like this, at taking a risk on something new and different. I had to learn to push back. I had to learn to even embrace a word that made me feel uncomfortable. I sometimes had to rebel. And that's kind of tough for a small town good girl. And it's a lot of work because you got to keep working at it. You got to keep honing the story. You got to keep finding different ways forward. You fail. You have setbacks. But you know what? You also become resilient. Our, I'm here to tell you that our world needs you to be more resilient. And I believe it's one of the main reasons you're here. And that's what I came to say today, so let me summarize. I hope you'll remember it's about making room for discovery, opening up to things that are, that are kind of weird, even being a little weird. Own and tell your story. It's the only one you got. Grant yourself permission to, to act. Here's the thing. You really don't just live this prescribed life where everything's perfect. You blunder your way toward creating one you love. With enough discovery, experimentation, and time, the future comes out of your imagination. It's very powerful, and I say, why not start now? Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Ms. Comstock, thank you for those incredibly inspiring words to pursue paths where we can appreciate what's weird, where we can embrace curiosity, and where we can explore and take risks with what's new. We're grateful to have you call us to that path of discovery, particularly right now, this year, as we think about the future of William & Mary and how to fulfill our mission in the decades to come. Our mission to convene great minds and great hearts for the common good. Thank you. In keeping with that purpose, we open each academic year by recognizing the dedication to service displayed throughout our community. At Convocation, we present two President's Awards for service to this community. One goes to a member of the faculty or staff and one to a member of the student body. Each receives $500 to donate to service agencies of their choosing. One, our staff recipient this year is Jania Anderson. Will you please stand and remain standing? <laughs> Championing a sense of welcome and belonging is one of our most profound commitments at William & Mary. So it is especially fitting that we open our year by recognizing your service, Ms. Anderson. You serve as an assistant director of student financial aid and manage William and Mary's student employment program. You've also served as an executive member of the Women's Network since 2012. As a core part of your professional identity, you teach us what it means to be a host, to welcome others, and to ensure that they feel welcomed. Your passion for food has inspired your work to address food insecurity on campus. And in the Williamsburg community, one of the most pressing issues of our age. You participate in the New Zion Baptist Church Food Ministry Program. You serve as a bell ringer for the Salvation Army and volunteer at Campus Kitchen. I'm delighted to share that you will be donating your award to New Zion Baptist Church and Fish, a nonprofit that provides food as well as hygiene and cleaning products with, to those in need in the greater Williamsburg area. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. We are so delighted to honor your service. This year's student recipient is Sonia Kinkabwala. 
class of 2021. So please remain standing. I have a few words to share. Deep personal relationships are at the center of your service. You are a tour guide and tried ambassador and a leadership advisory council student representative. You also served last year on the 100 Years of Co-Education Student Engagement Committee. You began volunteering with at-home hospice care during your freshman year. Your experience inspired you to look for entrepreneurial ways to invite others into service. In your sophomore year, you co-founded the Brunch Bunch program. This program cultivates cross-generational relationships among students and older adults in the Williamsburg community. I'm delighted that you will be donating your award to DeRote, where you interned last summer. Based in New York City, DeRote aims to decrease social isolation among the elderly. Ms. Kinkabwala, we are so delighted to be honoring your service. Thank you. Okay, everybody, this is the moment you've been waiting for. Let's bring it in. My, my advice to you right now at this moment is just to take the time to savor it. Advancement staff are going to start to pass out your Wren Traditions pins. There are different pins, appropriate pins for every class. The choir will lead us in just a few moments in the alma mater. The lyrics are in your program. All right, be ready to sing it loudly. So you're looking for your pens, which you will wear with pride, and you're looking for the lyrics to the alma mater. Following the alma mater, this is where we need to actually pay attention here. Everyone except our new students should move swiftly to the other side of the Wren. New students, Ms. Comstock, Provost Tagoras, and I will stay here, and we will wait until Student Assembly President Kelsey Vita and Graduate Student Assembly President Aaron Schwartz will lead us. I will begin that process to lead you through the Wren building. I will cue you for that, new students. After we've chaired on each member of our new community, we will enjoy a picnic and music in the sunken garden. Students, as you walk through this building, remember to bask in the new. All right, choir, take it away. Shall not stole a shining. 
Get <laughs> 